Nice to see you all back. I hope you all had, in person and online, a great lunch. Um, we have an exciting last minute addition to the program right now for a couple of minutes. Um, and to introduce that, I'd like to welcome our senior fundraising manager, James Clark, to the stage. Should we give him a round of applause, please? Hi, everyone. So yeah, this will only take a few minutes, but we really thought it was something um, worth sharing today. So if you don't know who I am, I work in the fundraising team. And this right here is Alex Backhouse, who I hope he can hear me. It looks like he can. Yes, I can hear you. Um, so if you don't know Alex, he is currently taking on our biggest fundraiser of the year for Retina UK. He's currently nearly at £20,000. And what is he doing? 17 marathons in 12 days. Wow. Which... So, we've got hundreds of people here in Manchester and online, but we thought it's definitely worth giving him a few minutes just to, one, have a break, because I bet he's knackered. I think it's day four. Um, but it's definitely worth celebrating. So, Alex, do you want to tell everyone just your reasons for taking on such an epic challenge, 700 kilometres? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you very much, James, and thank you everyone in the room for the for the warm reception. Um, I'm currently calling from from Plymouth, so yeah, day four, just about 200 kilometres in, about five and a half thousand, I think six thousand metres ascent and descent at the moment. Um, essentially, the reason I'm doing this is because three generations of my family suffer from retinitis pigmentosa, um, so grandmother, dad, brother, and sister. So, God, I'm gonna get emotional doing this. <laughs> So, yeah, just thought I'd start in Cornwall, which means a lot to the family, as <laughs> James, I might need you to fill a moment or two, or just keep, give me a minute. Oh. Um. As Alex so, says, so, yeah. is... no. So started started in uh, in, in 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 Lands End because uh, grandfather was he was Cornish um, and so spent kind of years going down there over the summer and live in London now. So I thought Lands End to John O'Groats was a bit too far. So I thought right, do Lands End to London. Um, got feverishly into planning and uh, yeah, looked looked far far less challenging from from the armchair of my kind of comfy warm <laughs> living room, but. Uh, four days in, still got a smile on my face. Uh, got got the kind of Dartmoor tomorrow. Pretty pretty grim weather, but yeah. So that's kind of the cause and why I'm doing it and uh, the challenge. And as if this isn't impressive and tough enough, he's got a baby on the way. He's moving house, <laughs> renovating. It's all going on, but he still took the time to do this for us. So, as he says, it's day four. Another eight days to go. Finishes in St. James's Park in London next Sunday, the 6th of October. So if anyone's local and wants to pop down, get in touch. We can send you the details. Um, it goes without saying, obviously we're all so grateful. Still such a long way to go. No, Is it good. nearly, it's about 200 kilometres so far, Alex? Yeah, so 200 kilometres in, about 215 by the end of today, I think. And then, uh, yeah, the rest, the rest still to come. <laughs> but, but hopefully another four days of coast path after today and then... Four more days of some pretty more typical terrain that I'm used to as I head into London, kind of gentle ups and downs. It's been the, uh, the steep coast, coast, coast path, kind of climbing all the way up and then having steep steps all the way down so you don't even get the benefit of, uh, benefit of having climbed the hill. So, yeah, the quads are feeling it, the feet are feeling it, but uh, luckily, at the moment, touch wood, no, uh, nothing more sinister than that, so just, just a bit of fatigue. I think this morning getting out of bed was one of the most difficult mornings. <laughs> And I think I'm probably going to have a few more, but yeah, it's nice that it's now kind of day nine, or rather nine days left, so kind of down to single digits. So, oh, amazing! I'm sure we're all going to send our love, big cheer from everyone here in Manchester and online. Um, well done. And just one thing. If if anybody wants to sponsor Alex, he's so close to £20,000. So if you want to sponsor him, come and find me or visit our website and we'll share the link. And 
One other plug, please get bidding on the bear and the dragon on reception as well. I've been asked to pass that message on, but thank you. I'll hand over to Kate now. And well done, Alex. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. I'm just going to pop back on just to introduce our next session and therefore introduce Kate. Um, but in this session, we'll be hearing from the next generation of research leaders in the field of inherited sight loss. Thanks to your donations, Retina UK has been able to fund PhD students who are making strides in cutting edge research. Today, we are joined by Kate Arkell, Research Development Manager at Retina UK, and three of our PhD students, Chloe Brotherton, Hasina Zariri, and Gabrielle Velichkova. Unfortunately, Gabrielle has been unwell this week, but she will still be joining us online nevertheless. Let's give them a warm welcome to the stage. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. Um, as Lauren said, part of our commitment to investing in research involves funding PhD studentship projects, which enable young scientists to take a crucial step forward in their research career. Um, PhDs are essential qualifications for careers in academic research or within the pharmaceutical or biotechnology industries, and are undertaken either sometimes straight after an earlier degree or sometimes after a few years of work. The students we support today are hopefully the research leaders of tomorrow, um, who will pioneer developments in the decades to come. Indeed, our keynote speaker, Professor Graham Black, uh, undertook his PhD with funding from Retina UK. Completing a PhD allows the student to uh, conduct an independent, in-depth research study for at least three years. Uh, working as part of a wider team of scientists and under the supervision of a senior researcher. Not only does the student gain a qualification and skills and experience, they also complete an investigation which of itself is uh, going to provide useful outcomes uh, for the field of sight loss research. So today we're going to meet our three current PhD students. Um, whose studentships are being jointly funded by Retina UK and the Macula Society. So these are projects that fo focus on inherited conditions that affect the macula, uh, the tiny area at the very centre of the retina, which is responsible for central vision. Um, two of the students, Chloe and Gabrielle, have already been working on their projects for a year or so, whereas Hasina is just about to start. Um, I'm going to speak to each of our students in turn, and then at the end, there'll be time for questions to all of them. Um, so just one after the other, um, I'm going to have to get used to Gabrielle being behind me, but um, do you want to, Hasina, do you just want to introduce yourself and just yeah. uh, say a little bit about? Sure. Thank you, Kate. Um, my name is Hasina, and I'm very honoured to be with you today. I'm starting, and like Gabrielle and Chloe, I'm just about to start my PhD at UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. My research project, which is generously co-funded by Retina UK and the Macular Society, will focus on understanding true symptoms that Stargardt patients are affected. That's two symptoms are called photopsia and photophobia. I was lucky to work for the last two, two years as a research scientist at the VPR lab at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology, which deepened, which deepened my, my interest to eye research and especially that I myself staggered patients. Prior to that, I worked like research specialist at genetic medicine labs in Qatar and in terms of my trainings, I hold a doctorate of pharmacy from Algeria and a master in pharmacology from Paris Descartes University in France. Once again, I'm very thankful of the opportunity of being here today to share with you my research plans and how they connect to my lived experience as Stargard patient. Thank you, Hussein. Um, Chloe. So I'm Chloe, um, 
and I've been doing my PhD for about a year now. So I'm based at the University of Edinburgh and working with Dr. Rolly McGaw, who's both an ophthalmologist and a researcher. So that really adds a new depth to being able to, to understanding further into a, the patient's aspect. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree in genetics at the University of Glasgow and then in medical genetics and genomics masters also at Glasgow before I made the short trip over to Edinburgh. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Chloe. Gabrielle, I need to look that way for Gabrielle. Gabrielle, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself for us? Hi, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, be part of this, and I'm really sorry that I can't be there in, in person. Um, so, my name is Gabriel. I did my bachelor's with an integrated uh, master's in genetics at the University of Manchester. There, I discovered my passion for development of this, um, biology, and um, I had the opportunity to work as a research technician for a few years after that, focusing on these projects. I worked with uh, stem cells, I uh, learned about genetic engineering and something really interesting called CRISPR, which really was the molecular scissors. So um, these skills um, really kind of uh, sparked my interest into like genetic engineering and gene therapy, which is um, why now I'm doing a um, project focusing on um, exploring one of those techniques called prime editing as a potential, maybe viable therapeutic option for patients with Stargardt disease um, under the supervision of uh, Professor Van der Spy and uh, Michael Cheatham at the University, of, um, University College London. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, Chloe, do you want to give us an outline of your project, just a brief outline? Yes, yeah, so I'm looking at a gene called RPGR, which is causes 90% of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa cases. So that's those that are inherited from the mother, but only tend to affect males. Um, and so depending on where the mutation is in the type of mutation RPGR, it can cause retinitis pigmentosa. Or sometimes it can cause, cause a more cone dystrophy. So those are the cells that are at the center of the eye that give you colour vision and visual acuity. So rather than losing your peripheral vision, you lose your central vision. But we don't know why those are different. And I'm trying to work out how these mutations cause changes in this gene and cause, cause changes in this gene can affect different people differently and cause, look at different cells differently. So why some genetic changes primarily affect the cones at the centre yeah. rather than, than the rods mm -hmm. around the edge. Um, so what attracted you to this project in the first place? Um, so I, whilst I was doing my undergrad degrees, I was really passionate about rare diseases and how much it can affect people and how it seems to be like one small change in what is basically a whole library worth of information can cause such an impact on people's lives. And this is especially quite prevalent to me because my partner's father has retinoschisis, which is where the retina starts to peel away from the back of the eye. So he is living with inherited sight loss. And the impact that that has on not just him, but the family overall. And you know, he went from being able to have a full license mm -hmm. and no longer has one. So I knew I wanted to do to be able to help people like him, and this project seemed to be able to help people with inherited retinal dystrophies. Absolutely. So it's nice that you did know a little bit about yeah. life with sight loss, um, and you've got that personal connection. Yeah. So just briefly, what's the plan for your project? What are you What are you going to do in the different stages? So for my project, I am utilising. Um, mice which have RP and by look, be, um, luckily for me the, the cones I'm, I'm able to take them out and look at how these are different um, structurally and what is changing in them and what is changing compared to what's changing in the rods because they are very similar structures normally um, I'm also using these really cool cell lines where we managed to tag some proteins. And by doing that, I can look under a microscope and they fluoresce in all these different colours. I can see exactly where they are in the cells. And by doing that, I can see 
I can introduce more proteins, so I can introduce RPGR into these cell lines and try to work out what is changing. And I can introduce that we have um, patient-derived proteins okay. that I can then introduce into the cells and see what difference does it make from, you know, the, the, the proteins that the patient has compared to you know, the normal or wild type protein. So you have had some contribution from people living with these conditions. Yes. So have you had, are you, have you got samples from people with cone dystrophies as well as people with RP and? Yeah, so we're quite lucky because um, my supervisor, Rowley, he works, he's like the leader of the clinic up in Edinburgh. So he has sent samples from patients from RP with cone dystrophies and he's also looking at um, different in different aspects of his lab, it's different inherited respiratory disorders, so it's really cool. And what does a typical day like look like for you, Chloe? And is there anything unusual or interesting, particularly that's a bit out of the ordinary for your project? Um, so a typical day looks like well, um, I tend to I think it's more in weeks because experiments take weeks yeah. to run. There's a lot of overnight waiting for yeah. cells to grow. It's like having a child sometimes. <laughs> um, so it's like I'll spend a lot of time in the lab, but it's also, I think what not many people know, is a lot of time on the computer analysing mm -hmm. and also a lot of time on the microscopes, which take up a whole room. Okay. And it's also very cold in those rooms. <laughs> um, and a really interesting technique so um, earlier this year, I had the pleasure to go to the Netherlands because over there they're using a technique which is called ultra expansion microscopy. And basically you take the retina out of, well, I'm using my size, and you put it in a gel and then you swell the gel up with water and makes the retina four times as large. So whereas normally I can see it at 100 magnification, I can see it at 400 times magnification. So stuff that you can't see with the naked eye looks massive to me. Um, and being able to go over there and I've now brought it back to the UK and I'm teaching other researchers in the UK how to use this technique, which is really cool. That's very cool. How long were you in the Netherlands for? Six weeks. Okay. Yeah. So what was that like, going to a different institution, different country? It was really fun, <laughs> yeah. Um, I only fell off a bike twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was really good and it helped with the networking and getting to know people from also like different insights as to how they do things differently over there because science is the same. Sure. Yeah. And it's also opened up like my collaboration and being able so over there they work with um, Libra congenital amaurosis, which you've heard about earlier, and be able to see how they use techniques like that that I can then take over to mm -hmm. RP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great because collaboration is so important. Mm -hmm. um, what are the ups and downs, Chloe? What's been particularly challenging? I think sometimes science just doesn't work. <laughs> you come in and it can, you know, the wind's wrong and it's a Tuesday and the temperature's <laughs> too cold and your cells haven't grown. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to try again next week and then next week it'll be fine and there'll be nothing you've done differently. Yeah. It just makes it feel, your cells doesn't feel like it this week. Um, um, so tell us a little bit about what you hope the outcomes will be from your project and how, how they will hopefully make a difference down the line for our community. Um, so I'm hoping I'll be able to understand more as to what RPGR does in the photoreceptors and that will hopefully, for, like, for patients, they'll be able to not just... Cause, so one of the, I'm sure as many people with RP, is it's the photoreceptor deaths mm -hmm. that it's really hard to then replace the photoreceptors yes. and all the gene therapies in the world won't, won't undo that damage. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping that being able to work out how the photoreceptors are dying and we could then help prevent them from dying and then that gives more of a fighting chance for the gene therapies to work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just about understanding that mechanism is the yeah. first step, isn't it, on the road to developing treatments. What about the future, Chloe? Have you got an idea of what you want to do? Um, I think I definitely want to stay in research. Um, the opportunity to help other people every day is something that really drives me. And the sight loss community, both in the scientific community and the wider community, is so lovely and supportive. I think it would be nice to stay in there.
Yeah, well, we'd love you to stay <laughs> as well. Um, I'm going to move to um, Gabrielle next, and I'm going to remember to speak to the front of the room. Um, Gabrielle, um, can you give us an outline of your project? Yes, of course. As I mentioned, I'm working on Stargardt's disease, um, which is one of the most commonly um, Mendelian inherited eye disorders because it affects everyone in 10,000 people, which is a quite striking number. Um, Stargardt is caused uh, by changes or mutations um, in the ABCA4 gene. There are about over 2,200 different variants, so it could be at the beginning, it could be in the middle, it could be at the end. Um, and it's very heterogeneous, which is making diagnosis quite complicated. But so what does, uh, what, what does ABCA4 do? Like normally when the way we perceive uh, visually the world is like we have a stream of light that hits an object, it's reflected and it goes into our eyes. And we have these uh, beautiful cells which are called photosensing cells, um, photoreceptors, which um, take up that information. They convert it into um, electrical signals and then chemical signals that our brain can interpret. Uh, and we can see, well, this object that I see, it's a, it's a chair or a table. Now, during that process, we have accumulation, like we have a lot of chemical reactions, and as a side effect of them, we have accumulation of toxic compounds, um, which ABCA4, what it does, it takes them away, removes them so they can be recycled, and uh, there they can be used later on again in that uh, light pathway. But if ABCA4 is not working, as it does in patients with Stargardt disease, we have accumulation of these toxic comp uh, compounds, which cause the death of photoreceptors, um, which is why people start to lose their ability to see in the dark or to see color or later in the more, during the progression of the disease, people lose their central vision. So one of the most worrying things about Stargardt disease is that there is no therapy. Uh, and even though there has been a lot of work and research in developing uh, drugs or stem cell replacement therapies, um, these are not working. And people have this, um, thought about, well, we have genetic engineering, we have all of these um, beautiful techniques as uh, CRISPR. Um, let's introduce a, a functional copy of the gene. But the problem is that ABCA4 is really, really, really big. So normally we put this back with a, a virus but these viruses are not big enough. So we have been facing a lot of challenges in actually figuring out, well, what can we create so that it can work as a therapy for patients? And here comes my project because thankfully we have advanced uh, really, really far um, research-wise. And now we have this very interesting technique that is called prime editing. And essentially what prime editing wants to do is go in the uh, eye of the patient find the photoreceptor cells in the retinal pigmented epithelium where the ABCA4 is found. And we want to correct the uh, changes or the mutations within the patient cells so that now this patient can um, have a functional copy of the ABCA4 gene. They can remove these toxic compounds and that would hopefully hold the progression of Stargardt disease. Thank you, no. Gabrielle. No. I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Um, what was it about this project in particular, Gabrielle, um, that attracted you? Was it was it because you were so interested in CRISPR? Yeah, most certainly. So I worked in a project before, which was using CRISPR, and uh, it's quite interesting the potential that CRISPR has. Um, on one side, it allows us to replicate uh, disease in um, cells, but also in uh, more 3D models. Um, but it also, it's a, it has a potential as a, a gene therapy. So that was something very interesting to me. I really wanted to delve in depth to have an understanding, um, how does it work? Uh, how well it works? Is it really possible for us to apply it uh, in clinic? How we can improve it if that's so? And something that was really nice about this project is that normally um, when you're trying to do such tests, you do them on uh, 2D uh, cells which are like flat in a dish. And that doesn't really truly represent the environment of the eye. Uh, and this project actually is using this retinas in a dish, which are called retinal organoids. So we can actually test uh, this gene possible tool for a gene therapy in uh, this retinas in a dish. 
So it's very, very exciting project, very challenging, but I can really uh, see how, you know, sometimes you struggle to see how the basic research can be translated into the clinic, but with this project, you can see a very clear pipeline. If this works in the lab now, these are the steps that we can later on take and we can push it down to the clinic and to the patient so that we can really make a difference. And maybe in a few years time, we can say, well, yeah, there is a, there is a therapy for Stargardt's disease. Yeah, that's <laughs> really, really exciting. Gabrielle, did you know anything about life with sight loss before you came to this project? I have been incredibly lucky in that aspect and I have, I have not been exposed to uh, people with sight loss. The closest thing is that my par uh, grandparents had cataract disease, but that's a quick uh, light um, surgery, so like laser surgery and everything um, improves. But as a kid, I used to do this. Um, you now we have these five senses, right? Uh, smell, touch, um, hearing, but we most rely on, on our visual um, senses. So I used to, try to close my eyes and imagine, well, can I actually go around in the world without having the ability to see? And it was quite petrifying. If I was doing it with my friends, I had to rely on them to hold my hand and to really trust them that they're not going to tumble down. And in these moments, I felt very anxious. Um, but I, all I can do is like, I, I could just open my eyes, right? And everything goes back into place. But now when Bavanya was talking, I was just thinking, well, there are so many people who don't have that option and it's scary and really, really need to take responsibility and put all of the energy and effort that we can as a society to make um, the life of these people as best as possibly can, whether it's going to be by supporting them and providing them the services that you as a lovely charity you are providing or us as researchers creating therapies which can really make, it, make a difference in someone's life. Thank you, Thank Gabrielle. you for giving me that opportunity to no, get an insight. You're welcome, Gabrielle. And mm -hmm. just quickly, I mean, your project's quite complex to describe. I was wondering whether we could just pick out a couple of aspects. Do you just want to, you did a webinar for us early in the year where you mm -hmm. gave a beautiful description of CRISPR um, and how that works. And then also you just mentioned the retinal organoids and I wanted, wondered if you could explain to our audience just in a really simple way how where they come from how you make them uh the crispr or the retinal organoids <laughs> uh, uh both i mean yeah um just a quick description of crispr in a little bit more detail okay so um we're mm, it's important for us to think where we use CRISPR. We use CRISPR in the cells, in the nucleus, where we find DNA. The DNA is the molecule that gives us information how to make uh, proteins, which are the components that make the, the cells, the tissues, etc. So uh, DNA is composed of uh, units um, that uh, form a code that teach us, you know, how to make a protein. But sometimes what happens with, uh, um, in patients is that uh, there is a mistake in this code. And that mistake causes people to form a dysfunctional protein as the um, ABCA4. So what we can do with CRISPR is uh, we have this little um, set of nucleotides, it's called, these little units. Um, which are 20, and they can go and find a particular location within the DNA uh, that corresponds to uh, the place where we have this change or damage. So we can target uh, this um, system. Um, this little guide brings together with itself a little protein that can help make a cut within the DNA. And by using a little template that has the correct information, we can actually um, correct the damage and put like uh, the, the right piece of the puzzle. It's like, <laughs> like metaphorically explained. But uh, CRISPR is really, really useful because uh, let's say that in healthy cells, we can actually replicate the disease mutations and we can make models. We can correct them, but you can also, um, going to the retinal organoids, you can take these uh, cell models and you can start differentiating them. Now, usually what it happens is we have a stem cell. That stem cell usually has, uh, it's called pluripotent uh, cell. So it has the potency to become multiple different cell types. And 
by putting different chemical molecules, you can push this uh, stem cell into taking a specific fate. Is it going to become a lung cell? Is it going to become a, a, a retinal cell? So what we, what we do is we have all of these cells, we give them different mixture of components, different food, uh, chemical molecules, and we start this, uh, they're called signaling pathways, which push them in this direction. And you have very precise time points in which you have, you have to add the different mixture of components. That usually takes a really, really long time. So to make a, a retinal organoid, uh, it takes 300 days. <laughs> so it's almost a year. Um, and um, it takes a lot of Saturdays <laughs> and weekends gonna, and a lot I of dedication. I was going to say, Hasina, do you have to do anything out of the ordinary in your project? So perhaps going, do you have to go in at the weekend to look after your cells? Um, yes, we do have to go on the weekend. Um, we also have in my laboratory a special Christmas in Easter Rota where some of us have to stay over Christmas to take care of uh, our, our retinal organoids because they're quite demanding. Um, but we, we do rotate and I have really lovely colleagues. So, <laughs> so you have all these tiny, them. tiny little structures in dishes and they all have to be cared for like babies, really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes um, so um, what, what are the ups and downs, Gabrielle? Have you had any particular, particularly big challenges so far? Um, well, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a complicated project. So um, one of the things that I find very hard is that um, because I'm designing this prime editor, we want to try a lot of different um, genomic locations around the area of the mutation that I'm interested. So I have designed multiple different um, options with a lot of different combinations. So like the load of work is really, really, really big. So sometimes I, normally people do, let's say two or three transfections in the lab. I have to go and do 90. <laughs> and then the next day I have to do 200 genomics, uh, uh, GDNA extractions and PCRs. And that takes a lot of, a lot of time, just maybe three, four months, <laughs> because I'm the only person there. Uh, it would be great if I had a whole team. It would work much quicker, but unfortunately I'm one. So I think that's quite challenging. Um, and also some of the things are quite technically demanding. So even if you read online and people tell you, well, this is the recipe, go ahead and do it. Um, often it's not that easy <laughs> and you meet a lot of uh, hiccups and it turns out that you have to uh, think of a, another strategy and maybe that doesn't work and then another one. So, but at the end of the day, when you, after all of this hard work, when you get your data and when you see something there, and I have seen something there, it is quite promising. It just makes it all count. <laughs> so do you think you want to stick with research, Gabrielle? What are your plans for the future? Um, I do want to stick with research. Um, I would be very curious, hopefully, if I can lead the project to a point where I can show, yes, you can do this in the retinal organoids. Um, I really would be curious to see what are the next stages. So we can show that it works here in the retinal organoids, but what is next? Is it mice? Is it uh, based in the clinical trials. So I'd really like after my PhD maybe to continue down that path and see how gene therapy is taken from, from the lab to the patient. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, <coughs> Hasina, thank you for being so patient. <laughs> Do you want to give us an outline of your project to start with? Yeah, my research project will focus on studying two underappreciated symptoms that affects Stargardt patients. They are called photopsia and photophobia. And as Gabriel mentioned, Stargardt disease is a genetic eye condition that causes a progressive loss of the central of vision. This disease is caused by a mutation in one of our genes called ABCA4. And if you wonder, Stargardt patients see like black to blurry spot on the center of their vision. Now for the symptoms that we want to study, photopsia, which is seeing light flashes that doesn't exist. And 
photophobia, or known as light aversion, which is a strong sensitivity to bright light, leading to strong discomfort and even migraines in some cases. In our project, we aim to study those symptoms, uh, their characteristics, what the mechanism, mechanism behind them, how and how we can improve them. Okay, and tell us a little bit, your story is a little bit different to, to Chloe's and, and Gabrielle's, your background's a little bit different. Do you want to explain how the idea for this project came about? Yeah, sure. So, I am, as I mentioned before, I was working for the last couple of years as a research scientist at the Visual Repair, Perception and Repair Lab at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. And during one of our lab meetings, I shared about my condition with my supervisor, Dr. Matteo Rizzi and Dr. Kate Powell, and the symptoms that I was experiencing. I highlighted specifically photopsia and how scary it was when first I start seeing light flashes while driving, mm -hmm. and how frustrating it was when I raised my concern to the doctor who said that it's not related to my condition. Luckily, my team was very supportive and encouraged me to explore these symptoms. From here, we joined forces with Professor Omar Mahru, who is the leading retina specialist at Moorfield Eye Hospital, who liked the idea. And so, we devised a pilot study based on a survey that was sent on to patients with Stargardt disease to confirm our assumptions. To our surprise, more than 90% of participants answered that they were experiencing photo photopsia. And they shared with us a very touching testimonies to express their relief that finally, some, some pe that finally those symptoms are looked for. Yeah, so somebody's <coughs> taking seriously and yeah. other people are acknowledging that yeah. this happens in Stargardt disease. And this is how, Kate, this pilot study became the cornerstone of, of my PhD project. So that was the pilot study. What's your plan for the main project? Yeah, for the next st steps, we'll first confirm this, uh, the proportion of affected patients, their specific symptoms, and how, the, how this impact their vision and daily life based on a survey. Next, we will try to correlate patient answer with their medical records and try to understand more how this relates to the disease progression and the different genetic factors. And finally, we will try to explore closely the mechanism behind these symptoms by designing non-invasive clinical tests. And how, will you, how are you going to recruit patients for, for your study? And, and how important is it that, that people take part in studies like this? Yeah, there's many ways in which we can recruit patients. For example, in our previous study, we reached out to Stargard Connected Charity to disseminate our survey to the patients that were registered with them. But in this stage of the study, we will focus on Moorfield Eye Hospital patients because we will need to correlate uh, our results with their medical records. Okay. For the second part of your question, I think it's very important for people with sight loss to share their experiences in, with research projects. Quite frankly, a study like m mine is all about understanding that experience and trying to improve it. Yeah, and so the more people share their experiences, the more evidence exactly. researchers can, can gather. What do you think, what are you most, have you got any concerns? Where do you think the challenges might lie? Or is there something you're particularly looking forward to? Well, I could think about the main challenge that is the recruitment of mm -hmm. uh, patients. We may know to have a representative sample for our study. Yeah. Or we need to recruit patients from different stages of the disease yeah. 
to include the different genetic conditions and take concern of their accessibility and abilities. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what do you hope this project will achieve? What do you hope the outcomes will, will help to achieve? Yeah, I think this, this project represents the first characterization of photopsia and photophobia in Stargard disease condition, which is in, in its own very interesting. The outcomes that we are looking for, we hope that the recognition of those symptoms by clinicians will enable validation of the patient visual experience mm -hmm. and uh, provide advice on what to expect as the disease will progress. Second, we, we believe that an improved understanding of the underlying circuitry will open avenues to therapeutic approaches for both these symptoms and the underlying disease. And also, I think our work will likely benefit understanding these symptoms in other conditions, mm -hmm. uh, on, on other inherited retinal conditions. Yeah, and I think it will be, it'll be really great to have that evidence that, that clinicians can then recognise this as a symptom important. of, yeah. of Stargardt disease, so nobody in future ends up with the response that you got, which was, this has got nothing to do so. with your Stargardt's. Um, just, we're, we're nearly um, at time. Um, Hasina, can you tell us really quickly, are you doing this PhD because you want to build a career in research in the future? Yeah, definitely. I'm committed to pursuing scientific career in IE research and stay connected to research related to Stargardt disease. Okay, and I'm just going to ask all of you quickly in turn. Um, if there are any young scientists in our audience today, have you got any quick tips that you could give them if they're thinking of developing their careers? Um, Chloe? I think read as much as you can and get as much information as you can and also reach out to labs. Like, researchers love to talk about their science. <laughs> <laughs> you can't shut them up. And they will happily take you and they'll take you for a week and show you what what it's like to be a scientist and help you to get on that journey. Gabrielle, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I definitely agree with Chloe that uh, you need to read a lot. But um, I think during your bachelor's degree, I think it's very important that you remain open and that you explore a lot of different uh, directions, like maybe microbiology, maybe development of biology, because this is really the time where you can figure out what your passion is. Because if you, let's say, committed yourself studying about cancer, but then at the end of the year, uh, at the end of your degree, you realize you're really passionate about neuroscience, well, I mean, you have closed a little bit of your doors because now you don't have the base on which you can build. So I think you should really remain open and learn and explore as much as possible. Um, you should do approach uh, researchers, ask them for opportunities to work in the lab because there's nothing more valuable than an actual practical experience within the lab and then also i think um, it's really important for all of us to remember that we have walked different paths everybody has had different opportunities and even though there might be a lot of people who are very brilliant and bright uh, and when you look at yourself, you're like, oh, I have this imposter syndrome. <laughs> I'm not very sure in my skills and my abilities. Well, I mean, pat yourself on the shoulder. You have come really far. And all that, um, the most important thing is that you learn more and you know more than yourself from Thanks. yesterday. So just be confident in that. <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle. Hasina, quickly. Yes, have... I agree with Gabrielle and Chloe, and I just want to add, that just pick a topic that you are passionate with and reach out, don't hesitate to reach out scientists and nothing beats a hands-on experience in research okay. domain. Thank you. Um, thank you all three of you so much. Um, we're a little bit over time, I'm very conscious because um, we were joined by Alex, which was amazing. Um, I think we, can we do questions for two minutes? Okay, yeah. so we have got our research Q&A session um, at the end of the day, um, and I think you will, too, will both be in the room still, so yeah.
And, and also, Chloe and Hasina are around in break time and would be really happy to have a chat if any of you would like to know more. Thank you.